Hello, Pastor Stewart here with your midweek Bible study discussion video for this week. We're going to finish up our reading through of the book of Ephesians for this week. We're going to finish up in chapter 5 and in chapter 6 of Ephesians for this week. Next week, we'll jump into another book of the Bible. Uh, I think we'll start the book of 1 Thessalonians, so feel free to uh, start reading ahead after tonight's discussion. And uh, today we're going to be reading from, uh, we'll start in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, and we'll uh, read uh, pretty far, mostly into chapter 6. At the end of many of Paul's letters, he has some various goodbyes and greetings uh, and specific people that he mentions. So we'll be reading through uh, chapter 6, verse 18. And uh, these are some interesting verses. They're very much of their era, of their time. And so we will see uh, how Paul lived in the society back then, and we'll think about uh, how these verses sound today. So very interesting verses. Some uh, might even rub you the wrong way, and we'll talk about that. We'll think about that tonight. Um, so we are in the second half of Ephesians, and Paul continues to write about uh, how People should act since they have experienced the lavish grace of God, the forgiveness and the blessings that God wants to pour out on us. That's what the first half of the book was about. Tonight, uh, Paul talks about relationships that people have, mainly in the home and how people treat each other. Even though these verses, many of them will sound strange to us, they would not have sounded strange to Paul's original audience, Christians of the first century in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, this would have been part of, their, of the secular culture that they lived in. So what Paul is talking about is taking the way relationships existed in the world back then, and he wants his readers to treat those relationships from a Christian perspective. Uh, so let's start reading and we'll see what we think about it. First, let me read chapter 5, uh, verses 21 to 33. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church here. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife was, must respect her husband. Okay. So this uh, starts to introduce the hierarchy that society had at the time. It had a hierarchy of who they thought was more important than who. It was almost like a chain of command in society. And these verses tonight kind of tracks down the chain of command for first century Greco-Roman society. At the top is men. Uh, males, husbands, and fathers, and then the women uh, that were in their family, then their children, and then at the, below that is servants or slaves that the family, meaning uh, the husband, would have owned or hired. So the first one here that it talks about is for wives to submit to husbands. Now, as you heard, the verses are pretty straightforward, but we can easily see and hear how these verses have so often been used to support the mistreatment of women, the oppression of women, keeping women down, keeping them silent, uh, 
not even letting them vote in this country until about 100 years ago, uh, not letting them have positions in churches, uh, limiting what their options and freedoms were. I think we can easily see how these verses would have been pulled out to support a lot of men and males who wanted to uh, retain their own power and authority and limit women from, uh, from having any or from having a voice. Uh, so that means a lot of sad things and a lot of uh, hurt and, uh, and like, like limiting oppression has been justified with these verses. Uh, one, one sad example that, that I came across, uh, a woman that I used to know was a very devout Christian woman, and she was in a, a marriage where the husband was emotionally abusive at times, uh, a little physically abusive, and I was concerned for her well-being, her safety, her health emotionally and physically, and I would encourage her to do what she needed to do to protect herself. And yet she would go back to these verses and she would say, well, she, she would want my help in knowing how to submit to her husband when he was being emotionally abusive. And it just broke my heart that she would get hung up on verses like these. And I would tell her uh, that is not a concern right now. The concern is your health, uh, your children's health. And uh, it, it was just so sad to, to hear these verses being used to keep her in that um, like painful, hurtful uh, relationship. And uh, I know that that has happened for hundreds of years and so, so, so many other families and churches uh, and countries. Uh, it is interesting that when misogynists quote these verses to justify their disrespect of women or their mistreatment of women, it's interesting how they overlook some of the later ones, like verse 25, which said that husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church and do anything that they can do to care for it, uh, to sacrifice for it, to give up everything in order to, like Christ did for the church, uh, to build their wives up, to serve their wives, to make their lives the best that they can possibly be. Uh, interesting how um, misogynists will overlook those verses and that idea when they're trying to justify keeping women silent and uh, keeping them and their opportunities limited. Uh, but that is part of the verses uh, that Paul has written here. Uh, we can understand why men would choose to ignore those later parts of this passage. Uh, because it talked about things that they had to sacrifice and to give up. Um, they would tend to focus on the earlier ones and just say, uh, wives submit to your husbands, period, and then they would not keep reading, uh, which is an even double travesty, I would say. Uh, and again, this is a glimpse into the first century Greco-Roman world that Paul and his readers lived in. And we're, we're going to talk about that later. Uh, so let's, let's keep reading for now, and then we'll jump back to kind of the overall um, uh, like discomfort that these verses have. Okay, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So it starts off saying children should obey their parents in the Lord. That's a good phrase to focus on uh, because if a parent is acting in a way that is ungodly or is not in the Lord or honoring the Lord, then children should not just blindly obey them, especially if a parent is being abusive or negligent. Uh, by the same token, a parent shouldn't use these verses to just justify uh, whatever they want to make their kids do or uh, any kind of mistreatment of their children. Uh, it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. That's who um, sets the ultimate standard of what is right and what is wrong. Uh, 
Uh, verse 2 quotes one of the Ten Commandments, and Paul points out it's the first of the Ten Commandments with a promise attached to it, uh, not just commandments like do this, don't do this, thou shalt not, you know, thou shalt. Uh, this commandment includes a promise to honor your father and your mother so that your life will be better and that you'll have long life and a good blessed life. So that's the promise that Paul is talking about, that the commandment, honor your father and the mother, uh, comes with the promise, if you do so, things will go well for you. And that's assuming that um, the father and mother are living in the Lord and are treating their children well and are treating each other well as true, respected, equal partners. It also says in verse 4 that fathers should not exasperate their children. Other Bible translations uh, translate the phrase as fathers should not provoke their children to anger. It's interesting that he doesn't mention mothers here, just fathers. Uh, as a father myself, I kind of go, hey, why, why pick on just the fathers here and not, and not um, encourage the mothers to follow the same rule? And I wonder if it's just, um, you know, as, as they wonderfully do, mothers are usually more loving. Sometimes fathers can be too demanding or too strict. And so Paul's saying, hey, dads, uh, ease up. Don't provoke your kids to anger by the way you treat them or discipline um, or rules or uh, standards. Don't exasperate them. Don't, um, uh, you know, try and force them to be more perfect than, than anyone could so that they, they feel exasperated or they get angry at you. Um, I think Paul would encourage a healthy mutual, mutual respect. Uh, absolutely. Um, now, curiously, these verses and these phrases uh, that I'm reading here, they have a shorter version. If you go and read Colossians 3, 18 through 4, 1, Colossians chapter 3, verse 18 through chapter 4, verse 1, they are a shortened, condensed version of our passage tonight. So maybe Paul wrote the, those two letters around the same time, and he kind of had the same ideas and instructions and encouragements that he wanted to give people. Um, so those verses, Colossians 3, 18 to 4, 1, say a lot of the same things as, the, as our verses tonight, but they're a little shorter. Colossians 3, 21, it, it talks about the, the parents and the children. It says, do not embitter uh, your children. Uh, it also, other translations do not exasperate, do not provoke your child to anger, don't embitter them, don't make them bitter, or they will become discouraged, it says in Colossians 3.21. And when I think about that, um, it, it, it makes me think of parents who are just so demanding and so strict and insist on, you know, straight A's all the way, uh, just perfect behavior, and anyone who's been a kid or had a kid knows that they're not perfect. The parents aren't perfect. The behavior is not perfect. The grades aren't going to be perfect and have everyone maintain their sanity. So don't, don't insist on that and thereby embitter your children or exasperate them, provoke them to anger. It's not going to make uh, your life any better or easier. I think, <laughs> I think uh, the times that I have um, leaned a little too uh, close to that, uh, it, it doesn't go well, and usually I'm the one that ends up being exasperated by the end. So it's, fathers, it's in our own best interest to not exasperate our children because it, uh, it takes a toll on us as well. Uh, instead of doing that, Paul says to train them in the ways of the Lord, which would not involve exasperating them, um, so that they won't get discouraged. We want our kids to be encouraged. We want to build them up and strengthen them um, so that they can realize their potential, not berate them for when they don't reach their, meet their potential, but to build them up so that we can help them reach their full potential. Okay, now we're going to keep reading. We're going to read chapter 6, verses 5 through 9. And I want to give a heads up again about these verses in particular because reading them today is 
uncomfortable and it's awkward and we're going to read them. And if you haven't read them before, you're going to go, Ooh, that that's tough. Uh, so we're, we're going to talk about them. Here we go. Ephesians chapter six, verses five through nine, especially these days with um, the right attention that uh, America's historic racism is getting. Uh, these verses are especially hard to read. It says, and this is the new international version that I'm reading from, slaves obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Okay. Yikes. As you heard, that's tough to read. That's a hard one to read and to think about. Uh, for many, many centuries, much like in the previous verses we read a minute ago, these verses have been used to justify terrible things, atrocious things. In the American South in the 1800s, uh, Christians and church-going people and ministers would use verses like these to say, uh, to support their opinion that it was okay to own humans as slaves. And that is awful. And that is wrong. And that is atrocious. So it breaks my heart to read verses like these and to think about all the terrible attitudes and systems that have been justified based on these verses. Um, now, it is worth pointing out that in other Bible translations, it uses the word servants instead of slaves. And in the first century Greco-Roman world, like in Ephesus, where Paul is writing, um, the situation with servants and slaves would not have been the same system as in the American South, uh, going back hundreds of years. And what I would say is the most inhumane, uh, sinful, cruel system of treating humans uh, almost ever. So the first century world that Paul is living and writing in, when, when he uses those words and thinks about it, it's not, it's not the same as in the uh, American South in the 1800s. So that's worth noting. But it is what life was like for the people in Ephesus. Um, they, they did have servants. There were masters and slaves. Again, not to the level of cruelty as in the American South. And what Paul is wanting to do here, I think what Paul's intent is, is to tell everyone who reads his letter to act with Christian integrity, no matter what position in society they find themselves in. So as you can see earlier, he wrote to husbands and wives and children, and then to servants or slaves, and then to, to masters or uh heads of households, saying, no matter who you are, be kind to everyone. Um, if you're, Paul says, if you're a servant, to be respectful. If you are the master of the house, then you should always be respectful. But again, uh, just reading that kind of makes my skin crawl. I think what Paul is trying to say, he's trying to say, this is the way that things are in our world today, in the first century, Greco-Roman world. So he's saying, anyone who reads this, I want you to be the best Christ follower you can be in our world. So on the one hand, okay, uh, he lived in that system. He lived in that society. And he was telling people, whatever position you have in our society, you should try and be the best kind of person 
uh, you can be and follow Jesus's examples, example as best you can. Okay, uh, I guess that's a fair point. But on the other hand, gosh, if only he could have seen outside of his secular system and his secular society, the one that he lived in, and kind of opened his eyes wider and realized, you know, wait a second, this isn't the way that God dreams for humans to live as a society. This could be better. It should be better. This is not God's desire for how how people, how a society should be set up. Uh, oh, if only he had said that. Uh, I feel like he, he kind of missed an opportunity on really helping people then and certainly for the next 2,000 years as people took his verses and justified terrible, terrible things. Uh, some Bible commentators that you read, if you read Bible commentaries, they'll try to um, kind of give a different spin to these verses. And they'll say, well, these verses are more guidelines for how bosses and employees should treat each other. And, you know, I guess, sure, you, you can read them that way and that's okay. Uh, I think it does kind of try to skirt the issue because this passage is so uncomfortable. A lot of Bible commentaries are like, let's just ignore the elephant in the room and come up with a better explanation. Uh, I understand that because it is it is uncomfortable. And that's why uh, hopefully you don't, I don't know, hopefully, but you don't hear a lot of sermons or Sunday school lessons on this passage because it is just so darn hard. I even thought about skipping this one uh, for today and just saying, eh, we'll, we'll just not even read the rest of Ephesians. We'll just stop here and be done with it. But it's there, it's in there, and people have used it for terrible things. So I think Christians today have a responsibility to read it and to think about it and to talk about it and to say, wow, that makes me uncomfortable. And uh, boy, uh, these verses have been used for terrible things. Um, uh, but what can we learn from uh, when they were written and why they were written and the ideas behind them? Uh, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't ignore it. You should do the hard, uncomfortable work to wrestle with it. So in any event, uh, as you read kind of at those last verses, Paul wants all of his readers to remember that we are all under, all of us are under God, our master and creator. And he says, God does not show favoritism, um, which um, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of like he's saying, you know, the, these are the structures and uh, like, command ranks in our society and no matter where you fall you should you should follow Christ's example but remember God doesn't show favoritism so even if you're at the highest or the lowest that doesn't matter um, so so that's an idea that I could say okay well good like that we need to remember and it goes back to at the end of Ephesians chapter 2 that we read a few weeks ago um, which reminded us that uh, God loves everyone unconditionally, that there are no outsiders, that through Christ, everyone is an insider. Everyone is a part of the body. Everyone is an equal, equal part, and no one is better than anyone else. Um, I wish Paul had kind of focused on that and maybe given some more explanation on, on his previous verses. Um, so despite how weird and uncomfortable a lot of these verses here at the end are, um, I, th I think Paul would still, you know, obviously agree with the earlier lovely statements that he had made in chapter two. Um, again, he just wants everyone in his society, no matter what position they are, to uh, to live as best they can and to follow Christ's example. And um, to, re to remember that even if you hold a high position, it doesn't make you better than anyone else who might have had a lower position in society than you. And, and we should remember that today as well. Even if you're a big, um, you know, executive VP, you know, big wig, corporate fat cat, uh, you're not as important as you think you are. And you should always serve everyone, everyone, no matter who they are, no matter who you are, in order to build them up. So whatever the relationship is that uh, you find yourself in, uh, Paul uses some secular examples from his society then to show how people should 
submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Remember, that was the first verse we read, 521, submit to one another. Out of reverence for Christ as an imitation of Christ Jesus, that's his guiding principle for any relationship that you are in. And I wonder if more people thought about that verse and thought of it that way, how would it change the relationships that they are in, that we are in, amongst our families, churches, work, out in the community? If more people thought when they woke up, how can I serve others today? Whether it's husbands, politicians, police officers, uh, executives, uh, bankers, um, you know, money makers, whatever the position in our society today, what if everyone got up in the morning and thought, how can I serve other people? How can I help build them up? Whew, <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, instead of keep others down so that I can stay on top and building up myself. So your homework for this week is to think about what's one way that you can change your mindset or behavior in some of your relationships, maybe with friends or family or with coworkers, so that you are living more out of reverence to Christ, that you are submitting to others out of service to them, uh, out of um, living as an example of Christ-like, Christ's life uh, to serve others. So that's your homework that I want you to think about uh, this week. As a benediction for our time tonight, I want to read chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. And uh, if you remember a few chapters ago, Paul talked a lot about our old self we should take off and the new self we should put on. So here's, here's another really great illustration of the new self that we get to put on when we give our lives over to God through Christ. So here's our benediction for today. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. So remember that this week, be alert, keep on praying, and don't give up, stand firm. God gives you the power to stand firm, even in our struggle against rulers and authorities and powers of this dark world. Uh, so stand tall, uh, knowing that you are filled with God's holy power. That's what you should put on uh, this day and every day. Thanks for joining us as we've read through the book of Ephesians. Next week, we'll jump into the book of 1 Thessalonians. See you then.